Hello, and thank you for joining us for another edition of Rail Rangers on the Road. Every month, the Midwest Rail Rangers take you to an interesting and unique railroad destination across the Midwest, including places in Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, and Wisconsin. The Midwest Rail Rangers, a 501c3 nonprofit, was founded in 2015 to provide onboard educational programs across the Midwest. Perhaps you have caught us on select weekends on the South Shoreline between Chicago and South Bend, Indiana. On private rail excursions featuring dome cars and other heritage rail equipment. Amtrak charters and motor coach trips organized by the 20th Century Railroad Club of Chicago. Open house events at the Wisconsin Great Northern Railroad featuring the Sky Parlor Car and the Mark Twain Zephyr and at various outreach events, such as Train Fest in Milwaukee and Mad City Rail in Madison, Wisconsin. And now, mark your calendar for the first Sunday night of every month at 7 p.m. Central Time for Rail Rangers on the Road. Without further ado, here is this month's program. It's January 9th, 2022. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm here with Robert Neal, our Vice President of the Midwest Rail Rangers. And we're here at Kenilworth, Illinois. And Robert, why don't you tell them some of the exciting things we're going to get to see? Well, you know, as Candace said, we're here in Kenilworth, which is about 15 miles outside this little loop on uh, the metro line here in Kenilworth. And we're going to see this beautiful station built in the 1800s and learn a little bit more about the history and how this village came to be developed. Stick around, you're going to find it really interesting. Okay. Hello and welcome to Kenilworth. Uh, my name is Tim Miller and this is Joseph Gackstetter. Joseph is the curator at the Kenilworth Historical Society and currently I am its vice president. And we uh, welcome you to Kenilworth and look forward to sharing a bit of the history of the railroad, uh, our station, as well as a little bit about our village history. So these tracks were completed in 1855. And I'd like to give a little history of, uh, and to put in perspective, what was going on in this area at that time. Uh, the city of Chicago was incorporated as a city in 1837, when there were 4,000 people. And at that time, there was very little development in this area. We're currently in Nutria Township. And the township was incorporated in 1850 when there were 400 residents. So it's uh, the railroad really was instrumental in developing this area. Uh, the first railroad in Chicago was from Chicago to Galena and that was in 1848. So this, this railroad was put, put in by the Chicago and Milwaukee Railroad in 1855. It was then taken over by, uh, or the, the, the line was operated by the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad uh, starting in 1866 and it purchased the line in 1883. So the, the railroad was, was instrumental in the development of the, these communities on the Chicago North Shore. Uh, the railroad en enabled uh, the population of Chicago to come to this area. Uh, the Chicago Fire of 1871 was also a major reason why people were looking to uh, leave the city. The two villages to the north of us, Winneka and Glencoe, were incorporated in 1869, 
and the village to our south, Will Met, was three years later in 1872. Uh, in the 1880s, Joseph Sears, who lived and worked on Prairie Avenue in Chicago, uh, would spend his summers in Glencoe, uh, either renting a home or staying with family. So he knew the area through the 1880s, and in 1889, he decided to move his family uh, to a more sanitary environment uh, in the country. And that's when he decided to purchase uh, the land, which is now Kenilworth. And it's, it's 223 acres that, ex that extended from the railroad tracks itself to Lake Michigan. And interesting enough that uh, the parcels of land were put together by the uh, Charles Simmons, who was the land commissioner of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. Immediately following, or in conjunction with the purchase of the land, the Joseph Sears formed the Kenilworth Company. And this was designed to develop every aspect of the village. And one of its first projects was the construction of the train station, because that was uh, required in order for the railroad to make scheduled stops. So Joseph will tell us a bit about the history of the station itself. So the, um, the Kenilworth train station behind us was built in 1890 by the, uh, designed by the architect Franklin Burnham, no relation to Daniel Burnham. Um, and you can see on the outside here the stonework, the rusticated stone is one of the signatures of Franklin Burnham's earlier works in Kenilworth. Uh, he was also the, uh, the official architect for the Kenilworth Company, um, so he built a lot of the first buildings. And so not only is the train station use, not only does the train station use this rusticated stone, but so does the uh, Kenilworth Union Church um, and his own home on 37 Kenilworth Avenue, which he built. Um, so the, you can also see behind me too the sign Kenilworth. The calligraphy there was done by Dr. Charles Smith, who was the secretary of the Kenilworth Company. And the iron bracket above it was um, is also original, done by the Vanderpool Company. Uh, I should also mention that the stone was, it was cut by the Young and Farrell Company, which had done other uh, stations, had worked on other train stations throughout the Chicago area. Uh, so they were brought on to help build this one as well. So the train station had multiple uses, especially in its earlier years. Um, one such was in this back area where you can see the vines growing up, was uh, where the express office was um, working, operating out of. Uh, that was for like deliveries coming in and, and going out. Uh, there was also the post office was originally inside the train, inside the station, which you'll get to see the inside shortly after. Um, and that didn't last too terribly long, the post office in there. But while it did, it also housed the telegraph, the village telegraph and the village telephone. So the residents would have to come to the train station if they wanted to get uh, quick messages out to any of their families or some distant communities.
everyone, we came inside and guess what? They have heated floors in here. And I'm definitely gonna have Robert put these in our house. So when I get up in the morning, my toes are nice and toasty. Until 1890, uh, Joseph Sears lived on Prairie Avenue in Chicago and he worked and was vice president of the N.K. Fairbank and Company. It was a company on the southwest side of Chicago that produced a alternative to shortening. It was a, 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 an alternative to lard. It was a vegetable shortening, um, as well as soap. It was known for uh, its famous soap, soap, gold dust, that eventually was purchased by other companies and eventually by Procter & Gamble. So Joseph made his fortune uh, and retired fairly early in the late 1880s, and soon after is when he purchased the land that would become Kenilworth. That was in 1889, and right away he formed the Kenilworth Company. And the Kenilworth Company was responsible for every aspect of the village's development, as well as promotion. Uh, and its goal uh, was to create a village that combined the comforts and delights of the country with the conveniences of the city. And in its first two years, in addition to the railroad station, it was, it was quite busy uh, in its development. And from the uh, Kenworth Company uh, ledger books, uh, we have this description of the accomplishments that were in place in the village December 31st, uh, 1891. So again, this was just two years after Joseph Sears had bought the land and all of this property was uh, a series of small farms uh, and was also the last undeveloped land along the North Shore. So I'd like to go through this because it gives you a, a fairly good idea of what was happening in those two years. And almost all of these uh, developments were superior um, and cutting, cutting edge technology, I guess, for the time. So number one, nearly three miles of sewers were constructed, uh, connecting uh, hubs to 200 lots. A waterworks plant was, uh, was built and capable of uh, serving a population of 2,000, filtered lake water, with three miles of the uh, distribution mains and the connecting supply pipes. Number three, a gas works uh, with a cap capacity of 80,000 cubic feet daily, together with three miles of the gas mains um, and their connections. Two and a half miles of McAdam streets uh, with brick and concrete gutters. Uh, three miles of concrete sidewalks, which was very unique to the side, to, to the area. Uh, most sidewalks at the time were uh, just made of wooden planks, and many of the streets were dirt roads. And so the McAdam Streets was uh, much more than a gravel road. It was a series of layers of different sized stones that were, were layered in such a way uh, that the water would drain off to the side. Uh, it was um, something, a great expense, but was also uh, quite superior. Um, and the, the streets in Kenilworth, many of them, even today, um, they're, they're fairly curvy. And judging from the old photos that we found, is the reason for that is because they built the streets around some of the major trees that existed. Sometimes the, the trees right out here on this time, they were in the center. Of, of the road, and you can kind of see that uh, even today the, the, the road widens in certain areas and that was to accommodate. Uh, the village just uh, redid one of the streets, uh, Cumberland, and uh, it was a beautiful curvy road, again, because originally because uh, to, to maintain to the, the beautiful trees. And when they redid the road, they did it completely. A new infrastructure of the, the sewage and, and the cable and everything, but they still put the road back with that, with that nice little subtle, subtle curve. So uh, continuing on uh, the different accomplishments of the Kenilworth Company, uh, the beach at Kenilworth uh, is protected by breakwaters and the high uh, bluff is uh, sodded, an attractive, 
Stone Railway Station, at which frequent trains stop. A model school building uh, for the accommodation of Mrs. Babcock School for Girls, Young Ladies, and, and Children uh, was built, um, as well as the, uh, her home that was a boarding school. And this provided a most uh, delightful school home to a number of boarding pupils uh, who are cared for by Mrs. Babcox in her resident. And this the school had uh, students not only from Kenilworth uh, and Evanston, but from the surrounding area as well. Number eight, a boys school, the rugby school, uh, has been opened under the direction of Frank Olmsted, a graduate of Harvard and Exeter. A post office, UX Express office, a telegraph office, and public and private telephones are now established in Kenilworth. And the plans are now being prepared for a suitable store building that was put up the following year just south of the train station. And at the time, uh, Kenilworth Avenue uh, just extended from the station to the lake. And it wasn't until the 1920s that they constructed the road over the tracks to West Kenilworth uh, that was ad annexed in the 1920s. Uh, the last mention of development, uh, 12 attractive homes are now completed uh, and occupied, and uh, two more are under construction, and 8 to 12 will begin uh, in the early spring, uh, and many will be erected during the, the coming years. So this gives you a, a bit of an idea of what was going on in Kenilworth for the first two years and, and what they had accomplished. Uh, that takes us to 1891. This, the Kenilworth Company continued to, uh, to maintain all of the features as well as develop all of the structures in the village until 1896. The requirement to become a village was to have 300 residents, and that was achieved in the fall of 1895. And papers were submitted, and the village was incorporated on February 4th, 1896. And at that point, then, the village government took over the municipal responsibilities. So to tell us what was happening right after that incorporation, I'd like to turn it over to Joseph. After Kenilworth's incorporation in 1896, uh, the village of Kenilworth took over all of the municipal, municipal responsibilities, the utilities and such from the Kenilworth Company. Um, and then just jumping three years ahead from that is when we first saw in 1899 to around 1900, the Chicago and Milwaukee Electric Railway Company um, started developing its line going from Chicago all the way up to Waukegan, Illinois. Uh, but originally, there was some contention in Kenilworth. Uh, Kenilworth residents and the village did not want the tracks to come through, um, play over the, the uh, Richmond Road, which you see right here. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, the, they ended up settling, and the electric railway company paid $22,500, uh, and this is in 1899, 1900, for uh, the land, which um, you can see behind you, and also this road. Mm -hmm. um, so the rail tracks then were laid, and it ended up being at somewhat of a curve here. So they were parallel to the Chicago and Northwestern tracks, okay. and they curved around the station. So like kind of this? pattern here? Yep, and just like you're pointing out, and then it came down, down this road here. Oh, okay. Uh, and that was why it was disputed for so long, was because of, you know, is this going to have, is this going to look unsightly, is it going to be safe, um, and eventually they ended up coming to an agreement, and the money that was gained from that, the purchasing of the property to lay down the tracks, ended up funding uh, this beautification effort in the entryway here in Kenilworth, hmm. or the original entryway. And you can see um, these stone benches and urns, as well as in the center, uh, a fountain was there. Um, it's currently being rebuilt uh, in the original, to, to look like the original fountain. So 
these were built to uh, with the, by the funds that were given by huh. the electric railway company, um, and this is also known as the the North Shore Line, this mm -hmm. electric railway. Uh, you also see on uh, this angle the buildings here on the left. Uh, this was built by the architect uh, Philip Mayer. It also houses the the police department, the village offices, and the historical society offices where I work. Um, and building on the right, behind the trees, was built by George Mayer, who is the father of Philip Mayer. Um, both of them, as well as the architect of the train station, behind us, Franklin Burnham, all lived in Kenilworth at the time that these buildings were built too. So that's an always an interesting thing we like to uh, reflect on is all of these three main buildings right in the original entrance of Kenilworth, uh, having very strong roots to the architects that kind of helped shape the village throughout, throughout its history. So going forward at the electric railway, um, as you, you may know, it, it, uh, known as the North Shore Line, it started to really boom after a while, um, and Samuel Insull is the one that's connected to that. As um, uh, So the North Shore Line became uh, the fastest interurban railway at the time, and um, it became under new management in the 1940s, I think around 1943, 44, and that really, they started to put prior, priority on buses. Um, running parallel to the North Shore Line. And the ridership of that of those electric trains uh, went down, and then the condition of the trains went down, and eventually the last ride of the electric railway was on July 25th, 1953, 1955. Um, Were the station, did it share this station, or did it have its own station, do you know? Uh, it had its own station. Oh, it had its own yeah, station. Yeah, and it also came, uh, it was back, uh, south of where we are right now. Oh, okay. Um, there were also a, a couple signal towers um, that were built along with it, and those are no longer here, unfortunately. They were torn down shortly after the rail, the okay. electric railway collapsed or was taken Not much, yeah. Um, well, we also heard the, uh, when they built the expressway, the Eden's expressway, that kind of... Uh, also put an end to that because it was yeah. just as fast, and people could take their people could take their own cars and not have to worry about schedules and that kind of thing. Right. So, right. Uh, and to go back a little bit to speaking of electricity and going back to some of the village's history, uh, in 1907, in the the uh, village of Kenilworth, uh, ended up giving franchise or rights to Joseph Sears to lay underground wiring to bring electricity to the rest of the village. Originally they were hoping to go with another electric company, um, I think one of Samuel Insull's company, to lay the underground wiring, um, but that company, Samuel Insull, refused to do it, thinking that it wouldn't be a long-term solution, it would have problems being underground, um, and also it would be really expensive. But they were determined to do it because uh, in the the installation of above ground wiring was kind of co contrary to that natural beauty that Kenilworth kind of aspired to have. And so that's when Joseph Sears got the rights to uh, design his own underground wiring system throughout Kenilworth, and that was in, in 1907. Um, yeah, and that, so that's about the. That's and so the tracks were. I guess torn up, and then they put a road, pretty much road over. But the tracks would have been right here, where the yeah, where the, the street the between the here before the the tracks were, and then oh, they okay. laid the tracks down in the uh, 1900 or 1899. Oh, okay. Uh, and so this is where the road was. Oh, okay. The tracks were there, but they, I imagine they when they tore them up, they repaved the road. Um, but at that time too, the road used to extend all the way down there, um, okay. and then at some point Town Field was added in and, and it kind of became a dead end here okay. uh, for Richmond Road, and now um, we go down Kenilworth Avenue. And then people, people maybe who, you know, we have so a lot of people who watch this from Chicago, some people who are from all over the country. How far is Kenilworth approximately from downtown Chicago? 
on the rail line. What would you say, uh, roughly? Fifteen. Just miles about fifteen miles north of down the from yeah. the Loop, downtown Chicago. And, uh, okay. I don't know how many stops it is. It's not that long on the metro, the, the, the Union Pacific. Well, yeah. I think you'll hear about that later. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's it. Perfect. the history of the railroad line itself that was uh, developed by the Chicago and Milwaukee Railway in 1855, taken over by the Chicago, uh, Chicago Northwestern Railway in 1869, and they maintained the, the service until the mid-70s when the Metra took over the operations, and was eventually, the line was sold to the Union Pacific in 1995, and just last year, the village of Kenilworth uh, arranged with the Union Pacific to maintain the station as well as uh, they were given the opportunity to rent out the ticket agent space to a, a vendor. So that's something in the works. Mm. Uh, there was a, a ticket vendor here until three years ago. Mm. So it's a, still a, a wonderful station that is used quite often, mainly in the winter. And uh, I hope that you come and visit uh, our village as well as the Kenilworth Historical Society, which is right across the street from the station. And one quick question about the um, operations of the trains. Um, we heard that a lot of the freight trains that come down from Wisconsin take a, a line to the west of here uh, through like Northfield and, and um, further, further south. Does any freight trains go through here, or is it just metro tracks? It's just the metro trains. Just metro trains. And uh, once in a while, back in the day, the circus train used to come through. Okay, very cool. Chicago Northwestern, and we learned a little bit about the uh, the North Shore Line, which also passed through here. Very cool. Uh, anyway, we want to invite you to stay tuned for our next virtual education program. Mark your calendars two weeks from right now, two weeks from tonight, January 23rd, 2022. And we're going to begin, begin a three-part series that night that you'll definitely want to tune into. We're going to get to meet a gentleman named Rolf Waylitz. He lives in Merrill, Wisconsin, and he has one of the largest collections of both model train and train memorabilia in the state of Wisconsin. So much so, we're going to devote the next three programs, uh, again, starting January 23rd, 2022, and then our two programs in February of 2022. Uh, we'll get to meet Rolf. He's almost 100 years old, by the way, and a Purple Heart World War II veteran. This is a, uh, a must-see series. So again, you'll want to tune in for that very first part, January 23rd of 2022. Until then, for the Midwest Rail Rangers, I'm Midwest Rail Rangers President Robert Tabor in Kenilworth, Illinois. We will see you in Merrill, northern Wisconsin, two weeks from tonight.
Or you just want to get the train as it goes? Mm -hmm. Go do it? Mm -hmm. Your arm's not going to get tired? No, it's... Shh. the Midwest Rail Rangers, thank you so much for joining us for this program. Here's a look at the next program. Make sure you mark your calendar for this and we look forward to seeing you then. In the meanwhile, if you're planning an Amtrak trip, don't forget about one of our exciting and interesting rail route guides. For more information, go to www.railrangers.org. That's www dot railrangers dot org and click on the rail rangers store there there are plenty of options for both local and long distance rail route guides and traditional book format pdf ebook and even mp3 podcasts until we gather together next month the first sunday of every month at 7 p.m central time we hope you have a great week and a great month ahead and come out and join us on one of our onboard educational programs. For a listing of our in-person programs, go to our website. Again, that's www.railrangers.org and click on Upcoming Events. Until next month, we'll see you then.